Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Today on the channel, we're not going to do the daily dose of doom and gloom in my personal opinion. We all know how bad it is and how bad it's going to get, so that can wait till tomorrow. Today I want to talk about something far more important. This is going to be a discussion about immutable laws, phenomena, tendencies that are going to emerge post-disaster. They are related to human psychology, the way that society is structured, the way that our electrical grid and how our complex societies are organized. Rule number one, I call the 0.01% gridlock rule. It only takes one car to get in an accident at rush hour to bring thousands of cars to a grinding halt. This is a great metaphor to understand the lack of resilience of our very complex network, our interconnected network of critical infrastructure. It only takes one car, one accident, okay, to stop a thousand cars. Now, what would happen? We've all been in this situation where, you know, it's 5 p.m., you just got off work, and traffic is backed up for miles because of one incident. Now, what do you think would happen if there was two incidents in different parts of that freeway? What about three incidents? It really only takes three incidents, three bad things. In psychology, they say it only takes three major life uh, crises to push somebody over the edge and compel them to self-deletion. In the same way, it only takes three big accidents before you have a, a municipal emergency, maybe even a state emergency, depending on what freeway it was. So it doesn't take much. These choke points exist all throughout our very complicated society. Most of our society is structured to be serial processed. So it's not parallel process. It's not just like there's freeways everywhere and there's tunnels everywhere and there's multi dimensions of, of tunnels that we can utilize at a whim. Then there would never be traffic, right? Because these things are expensive to build and such for the sake of not efficiency, but for the sake of cost effectiveness, this is how our society typically is structured. So we have these choke points in very complex societies, these linchpins. The Suez Canal was another great example. All it took was one ship that was turned sideways to bring the supply chain to a grinding halt in that part of the world. And there's numerous choke points around the world. The next one is going to be Taiwan, the Taiwan Strait. I believe it's 40% of global trade uh, traverses the Taiwan Strait. So these traffic jams, these jams in the system that emerge, there's a certain what they call absorptive capacity of any uh, level of critical infrastructure. So if you're talking about a great example of this is the, you know, the curve that we all heard about for the last three years. You know, we got to keep, we got to flatten the curve because had we exceeded the curve, then there would have been overwhelm and there would have been chaos. So hospitals have a certain absorptive capacity. That's how many beds are there at any given time. They also have what's called adaptive capacity. So it's how many beds can we put out in the hallways if need be? How many beds can we stack up in the cafeteria if need be? How many schools or public facilities can we utilize when the real bad pandemic comes around? Okay. Now you can do the same thing in a, any sort of small scale emergency, but beyond adaptive capacity, that's pretty much it. And it doesn't take much with the 0.01% rule. It only takes one car, remember to bring all of traffic to a grinding halt because you got to get emergency services in there and the whole nine yards, right? And then think about how many other aspects of our society get slowed down as a result of that. So we take for granted how smooth things run, but all it takes is a few. Uh, people often mistakenly overestimate the amount of vehicles that would be neutralized during an electromagnetic pulse event. According to the experts, in the worst case scenario, you're probably looking at, 
you know, and this is an upper level estimate based on actual tests that have been done. I've brought EMP experts on the channel before that 10% of vehicles, like that's the absolute maximum. It was really only like 5% of vehicles. Uh, but of course, there are many uh, reasons why that these results are possibly understated. But what I'm trying to say is that even if 1% of vehicles were neutralized by electromagnetic pulse, imagine one out of every 100 vehicles just stalling on the interstate or just stalling on the freeway. It would be immediate gridlock. I mean, we're talking about you know, hundreds of thousands of vehicles uh, traversing the major corridors every single day. It really would not take much. Okay, so this is the 0.01% rule. It just takes one blown pipe. It just takes one blown transformer for a widespread power outage. It's hypothesized that it would only take the destruction of a handful of the major transformers in the United States and Canada to bring down the entire power grid just a few key nodal points and the whole power grid goes down. It only takes a fraction of a percent of one given aspect of something. Think about a fuse in your car. You have this, you know, $20,000 machine, $50,000 machine, however much your car, you know, and all it takes is one little fuse. How much does a fuse weigh? A couple grams. This you know, monstrosity of uh, mechanical engineering, thousand pound thing, 2000 pound thing. And all it takes is one little thing that's a couple grams. And if that thing doesn't work, the whole system shuts down. That is our society. Things work because we don't exceed the 0.01% rule. But as soon as we exceed it, it's chaos. The next rule is the 99% compliance rule. I made a video about this recently in that the majority of people will just kind of go along to get along. There's very few trailblazers. There's very few people who are going to charter a new course and go outside of the crowd. Uh, for starters, a lot of people are lazy. Most people are, they just are comfortable going along to get along. Not that they're followers per se, but they just don't have any curiosity that presses them beyond what is commonly accepted and understood as being sufficient. So I use as an example in that case as, you know, if tourists, for example, most of them will just sort of clamber around the core roadside attraction area. You could say it's time constraints. You could say it's a, a lack of uh, awareness of what's going on in that region. But I think it mostly has to do with the fact that there's no signs indicating to them where you should go. Uh, tourists, most, of, most tourists will stay in the allotted area and they will just follow the signs. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, but this can also manifest in a very dangerous way. One way it's manifest throughout history, as we all know, is people who are just following orders, right? And everybody assumes that, well, I would never do that. That's, that's all in the past. Well, I can tell you throughout the thing in the last three years, because I never got the intervention and I had to pay, it was around a hundred bucks every three days to go and get this certified test. And every day I would have to go to the gym because I try to stay in shape. And that's where I need to go after this because it's been a, it's been a cheat of a summer, we'll say. And uh, every day I would go there. There was some of the workers were all right, but there were some of the workers who were so they felt so empowered to ask me for my papers, and they almost looked down on you with disdain because if for whatever reason they they may have had their own motives as to why, or maybe they thought that my intentions surrounding the whole thing, I never pushed it on anybody, I never brought it up, it was my own business. And I showed my papers here, I tested negative to show that you know I don't have the virus. And uh, there was one person in particular who had always really seemed to take a lot of joy in asking me for my papers and scrutinizing it and making sure that all the dates were correct every single time, even though this person knew 
See, a lot of people feel empowered by the herd because they know deep down that they lack true power in their lives and they're likely never going to have true power in their lives. So this is why you have people on power trips within their, their little niche area that they work within, even though by and large, it's a powerless, powerless position overall. But going back to the point, is that this 99% will comply to the death of others. It's actually been demonstrated in the Stanley Milgram social psychology experiments where experimenters found, and this is a very well replicated study, that in 90% of, not, not always, it depends on, on the conditions, how close the scientist was, uh, the language that they use, but it's been replicated in a variety of different ways. And then the most extreme condition, 90% of people would comply. And what they were complying with was essentially murdering somebody. Um, not murdering in their minds. It wasn't considered that. They felt that they were a part of an experiment. This is the kind of experiment that you wouldn't be able to do now because of ethics approval. And that just tells you too, like where we're at is that we're so disconnected from reality that the ethics approval board won't let you study things that actually need to be studied. And people need to remember these things. And they know that if they were to do this same test today in some other form, the results would be exactly the same. Maybe that's what they're concerned about. They don't want people to know that the results would be exactly the same and that we will do exactly what happened in World War II again when the conditions are right. So anyways, 90% of people were encouraged by a scientist, the person pretending to be a scientist, to shock another person basically to death until they were non-responsive, okay? Now it differed depending on if that person was in the same room or if they were in visual range, if they could see the person, et cetera, et cetera. But 90%, okay? So it's really probably more like the 90% compliance rule, but 99% of people will seldom initiate and trailblaze out of fear of social uh, condemnation or ridicule or embarrassment. Uh, most people will not. You know, there's a great example of this. If you go, there's a video on YouTube. It's a guy who's, uh, he's at a rave and he, there's nobody dancing. Everybody's just sitting down. And this one guy gets up and he starts dancing. And then, you know, a couple other guys come and then, you know, a few more people come and then it hits this critical mass and it's safe enough. So everybody flocks and descends and then all of a sudden everybody's dancing. But that one guy was the 1% who defied the, the norm, who defied the group thing. The next rule is the 90% mountain rule. Let me see what we're at for time here. We might break this into two videos actually. The 90% mountain rule, I call it. I've climbed a lot of mountains in my life. Not the type, type where you need ropes and belays, but it's basically scrambling. So scrambling is when you don't need ropes, but typically you're on inclines that are steep enough that it requires at least three points of contact at all times, especially when you approach the summit. So anyways, um, the thing I've discovered with mountain climbing is that if you think that you're halfway up the mountain, you're probably only 90% or you're probably only 10% of the way. You still have 90% left to go, okay? And this is because most of the, the things in life that are worth doing are far more daunting than we ori originally realized. And if we knew how hard it was gonna be at the start, we probably wouldn't have endeavored to do it at all. Now, how does this pertain to survival? Well. There's an old rule, and I don't know the exact number, but it's something to do with if you, if you want to know how much firewood you need to get through the night in like a winter, in a cold winter night, and as presuming you don't have a wood stove that's highly efficient or something. The old uh, rumor is, is that you, you basically, you want to see how much firewood, right when you think you had enough firewood, you want to double that and then multiply it by 10, okay? So the idea is that you drastically overestimate or underestimate 
how or what's going to be required for your survival. And the same principle can be applied to stockpiling food. How much water are you going to use? How much power are you going to use? When you think that you have enough, you probably are just getting started. When you think that you're halfway up the mountain and you're almost there and you're preparedness, you've probably just started the journey. Okay. Now I've done whole videos on the mountain metaphor because I do believe that there's something about climbing a mountain which teaches you so much about life because it's analogous to so many things. You know, when you start off, I always say it's a physical exercise because you're getting your body conditioned, you're getting your body warmed up. As you proceed up the mountain, there's some unknowns because once you're in the, you can see the peak of the mountain when before you start but as soon as you descend into the forest you sit, you cease to actually see the top of the mountain and you have like these false peaks that you'll continue to see and they're oasises and you think oh the, the peak is right there but it's really just another plateau and then once you get over that you realize that the peak is way the hell up there still so the second part is kind of emotional and uh, this is when you start realizing, oh, maybe I can't do this. You know, is there going to be a frickin' mountain lion or grizzly bear? And the bugs are getting bad. And then it becomes a mental game after a while because you have to do root finding. Because typically, the harder, higher up you go in the mountain, the more challenging it gets. And then lastly, for the final leg of the mountain, it becomes almost spiritual. Because at that point, it's, it's such a... It, it's, it becomes an experience, an ethereal experience almost, once you start approaching the summit. But we're getting off topic here. Let's get back to, let's get back to this. The next is what I call the 100 to 1 rule. Many of you guys are probably familiar with this. I've made dedicated videos about this. It's 100 times easier to do now what it would be to do when the grid was down. Okay, so if you think that getting calories is going to be, is hard now, just wait until there is no grocery store. Just wait until you can't go and buy a bag of rice. Right now, you can work for an hour, you can go and you can buy a bag of rice that will include 60,000 calories. In order to get that equivalent amount of calories in a grid down situation when society has collapsed, it will likely take you a month. You'll be working every single day in the hot, hot sun. And some people say, well, no, I'm a farmer. I know how to grow this and grow that. But yeah, there's still a whole bunch of work. You got to keep the pests away. You got to weed. You have to make sure your fertilizer is all set up. You have to deal with uh, pestilence and marauders and, you know, water. How are you going to irrigate? Is there a drought? And yada, yada, yada. So 100 to 1 rule. It's 100 times easier to do everything now with electricity and with oil and gasoline and this uh, vast network of uh, energy grid that we have, then it's gonna be when the shizzy hits the fizzy. The next is what I call the self-efficacy rule. Self-efficacy rule. And that is that when you think that you can't go further, most people, because you seldom push yourself, especially in the West, you know, most people who, I mean, we've all, to some extent, been born with a spoon in our mouth. Not everybody's been born with a silver spoon in our mouth, but the majority of the people in the world aren't even born with any spoon, much less a silver spoon. But I do think that uh, the vast majority of people in the West have not truly had to push themselves in a, a really significant way in the sense that they've truly been tested as if it's a life or death situation. And what I will say to people is that I do believe that you will come to find that when you think that you, you can't go on any further, when you, the first time that thought comes to your mind, I can't go on any further, I, I don't think I can do this, usually you're not even 25% of the way in terms of how far you actually think you can go. And this is a good thing. Uh, I used to do a lot of running where I would run long distances. I never ran a full marathon, but I would frequently run like half marathons. And I wouldn't call it that. I would just go running like Forrest Gump style, like for a night I'd run for hours. And what I discovered was if you can overcome 
like 10, 15 minutes of pain. And that's when the adrenaline is going to kick in. And that's when things change. And I recently took my eight-year-old son up a mountain. And within that first 25% of the mountain, he became emotional. He became physical. His feet felt heavy. And then I kind of coached him on pacing yourself. And there was all these people who, you know, we were passing and they would pass us. And then it was kind of a tortoise in the hare thing. And I told them, look, everybody has a pace. You can walk up this mountain continuously. I don't, you give me the most out of shape person in the world. They have a pace that they can sustain and that they don't have to stop. And my whole goal with him was to say, you're not going to stop. We're not going to stop like these people who are stopping and taking breaks. The reason why they're stopping and taking breaks is because they're not pacing themselves properly. And he made it up that mountain. Well, I made sure he made it up that mountain. I pushed him and I, cause I knew he wasn't even close to his limit. So what I'm saying is most people don't know their limits. So when you think that you, you're about to hit your limit, chances are you're not. People who said, oh, I tried my best. No, you probably didn't. <laughs> you, know, you probably really didn't. If you think back, there's things you probably could have did better. You probably could have stayed at it a little bit longer. So we're talking about, you know, it, it does get dangerous to a point because when I recently interviewed Juan Pablo, the guy who didn't eat for 20 days straight on the show alone, you know, at some point it, it gets dangerous and he knew what his limits were. Okay. So there's a point where, you know, the classic example is the guy who has a heart attack after he collapses after running the marathon. There is a point when you go too far, but seldom will let people ever hit 90% of their true capacity in any aspect of life, much less 99%. So that's the self-efficacy rule. The next is what I call silence is the worst form of violence. The master makes no sound. And if you notice some of the best boxers, some of the best fighters. I'm talking about the goats. I'm not talking about the boisterous guys who get, you know, all the superstardom like the Conor McGregor's. He's not the goat. You know, he's, he's a great entertainer, great fighter, but not a goat. You look at some people like Floyd Mayweather, for example. I don't think that guy has a scar on him. You know, you look at people like Anderson Silva, who they lost a lot of their fights towards the end. But there's something about these types of fighters, like the real greats, the all time greats, they don't get hit and they make everything look easy. The master, you can tell somebody's a master by something because you won't know they're a master. It's like that gymnast who just goes in there and makes everything look really easy. Uh, they don't, they don't exert any unnecessary energy whatsoever. They, they just use the bare minimum amount of energy. They're the most efficient in their dexterity and their motor skills. And, you know, the goat scars, I believe, like the greatest of all time, their scars are psychological as opposed to physical. Those guys don't want to get hit. The masters, the true masters are evasive masters. And they're also silent. And you notice this too with people who are very strong if you go to a gym. Uh, the guy who's really making a big show of things tends, tends to, and not always, but seldom is the guy who's like the strongest in the gym, you know? Um, you just learn things to do things so well that it becomes such second nature that you've trimmed it. You've trimmed it of all of the unnecessary movements and you just do the bare minimum thing. And they also are the most humble in a way because you also, you, you know, you know your true weaknesses. You know that you bleed just like everybody else. Anyways, that's the, the silence is the worst form of violence rule. The next rule is to fear the man with one gun. Familiarity trumps variety. You know, give me one pair of pants for the rest of my life. I don't care. I'm not a fashionista. Give me one good flashlight that checks all the boxes. 
for the rest of my life. You might give me future, like better iterations of it, but get me one great flashlight like this one here. Oh, product placement time, like my Streamlight Wedge, that checks all the boxes. Easy to turn on, flat form factor, deep carry clip, perfect flashlight. Good amount of lumens. You can always increase that in the future. You could always increase the battery life expectancy, but overall, perfect. And why? Because the greater the familiarity I have with this thing, the more depth I'm gonna be at using it and maximizing it for its capabilities. It's better to have one cheap old firearm that you've shot for 20 years than the newest, highest tech firearm that money can buy. Maybe with the exception if you have like a thermal optic on there or something that, you know, is a total game changer, then sure. But it's just the mechanics of it, the, the motor skills that go into it. We recently interviewed, uh, once again, I went out to BC to visit my buddy Rod Giltak of the CCFR, and we're having this conversation about bandwidth. And I think you guys are going to enjoy that because a lot of people overestimate their capabilities in a gunfight. People who have never really fired a gun, or even if you have fired a gun, you see what happens in the movies. Guy is running, shooting a moving target, doing headshots, whilst moving, whilst under a lot of adrenaline, whilst already bleeding out and doing all this stuff. And you have all of these variables that you know make it just seem like, yeah, it's gonna be easy. But you only have a certain amount of bandwidth for any cognitive task that you have to do. So the, the more familiar you are with something, the better. Familiarity trumps variability. Familiarity trumps variety. So it's better to have, and, and this is why you see my wall of preparedness stuff, but really I'm not, a, I'm not a hoarder. I'm not a collector of this stuff. I use the same thing every day. I use the same flashlight. I've used the same Benchmade knife. I wear the same pants. You know, I wear the same uh, hybrid hiking sandal in the summertime because you still want to have the capability to run fast if you have to. You know, you still want to have the, the ability to kick somebody if you have to. So I'm always thinking tactically in terms of OPSEC. But, you know, I don't change something unless I really have to change it. It's, I don't need 50 guns. I need one good gun of every type, of every, you know, niche area. So one good shotgun, one good 22, one good large bore uh, long range rifle. Um, fortunately, we can't get handguns anymore, but uh, you know what I mean. So, fear the man with one gun for he knows how to use it. Adaptability also trumps preparedness. This is the next rule. No matter how much you prepare, prepare to lose it all. And this is what, this is a fear of a lot of preppers, that we can't get too attached to what we have because we may get separated from it. And you have to ask yourself as a prepper, and I don't think you're truly a preparedness expert unless you can do the following. Unless you are comfortable losing everything you have and still confident in your ability to survive in whatever situation you might be faced with, then I don't believe that you are truly fully prepared. There's that whole saying, knowledge weighs nothing. It's true. And there are force multipliers. Technology is the greatest force multiplier. It goes back to the 100 to 1 rule. Technology makes things 100 times easier. I mean, a lighter is 1,000 times better than having to go out, cut uh, the right type of softwood, mix it with the right type of hardwood, make a bow drill and sit there and try to light a fire and then go and find all these natural materials and tinders and all the rest. I mean, a thousand times better. It's really a thousand to one rule. And, uh, you know, the same thing applies. So adaptability trumps preparedness, but that's not to, that's not to, you know, take away from the fact that having those preps on hand is important because it is 1,000 times easier. Some people use it as an excuse not to gear up, not to 
maximize resources or some people might use it as an excuse to scoff at those who do uh, are privileged enough to have those resources at their disposal and say well yeah but you know you've never been in the shit so you're going to die when shtf maybe but even if you're a navy seal if you only have a knife and buddy has you know a decent firearm with a good optic i mean you're screwed right so that technology is a is a force multiplier it's an equalizer it should not be underestimated but just prepare to lose it all and then ask yourself are you mentally and emotionally capable of continuing on thereafter if you lose it all that is something to consider and then there's the old two is one or sorry two is two is one one is none principle so yeah it's important to have a backup so you know on my edc for example if i don't have my knife i i just feel wrong nowadays i just feel it just doesn't feel right if I reach down and it's not where it's supposed to be, I almost have a panic attack, like a miniature panic attack. Like, wh where did I put it? Where did I put it? It's kind of like when you lose your phone. So, you know, it's good to have a backup. And my backup, it's either a mini bug out, another mini uh, Benchmade bug out, or I have this knife on here on this SOG multi-tool, which I cannot open right now for some reason. There we go. And uh, so, you know, it's always good to have a little bit of a backup. Now, in terms of flashlight, well, I have the flashlight on my phone, I have my wedge, but I also have a flashlight on my watch, which is probably one of the most frequently used things on the watch. So it's just the idea that, you know, for the, more, the most essential things, if you're heading out to the bush, yeah, you need two modes of starting a fire. You need two ways of purifying water. You don't necessarily need two of every single thing obviously but the things that are most essential to life yes two is one one is none because you're going to lose that one or it's going to break or something to the effect now the the counterpoint to that the counter argument is that well if you have too many things then you're not going to value it as much neil tyson when he was on uh, joe rogan he he explained to joe rogan why he didn't put a phone case on his phone. I think it's one of their most popular short videos. And it was a very good point. I don't agree with everything Neil Tyson has to say, but I did agree with this. And he said, uh, for one, he wants to use the phone as it was intended. He likes the sleek, you know, thin uh, profile of the phone. And he also, it, it's something like, you know, if you get an expensive spare, pair of sunglasses, you'll never lose it. And that's why I carry a very expensive Benchmade knife, one of their best knives because if i lose this i'm screwed okay because it cost me a pretty penny so you know one is one is none two is one there's a counterpoint to it but i still do think having a little backup is not a bad idea let me know in the comment section below if you guys have other rules that you follow as it pertains to preparedness and if you would like us to do a deeper dive into these concepts that I just uh, briefly talked about today. And tomorrow, we're gonna get back to business as usual, talking about the news and uh, talking about preparedness stuff. I got some cool gear to show you that uh, I've been traveling across the country recently and uh, meeting lots of people, seeing lots of things and learning lots of things. And we got a lot of stuff to share with you. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is at, by gearing up at the best, the hands-down best preparedness store out there, CanadianPreparedness.com. Thanks for watching, guys.